Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our second uh, lecture on our HTML5 lecture series at SNHU, and this is lecture two, and we're going to ask ourselves, what is a platform? And that's important, especially when we're going to be leading up to HTML5. Now, I have to ask you folks that are here, what do you think about this? How's that look? Is that okay? Or would you prefer the shiny, the shiny stuff, you know, that sort of beats on the camera? I'm going to try this and, and see uh, what our viewers have to say. They might say take it off or what have you. But anyhow, let's talk about a platform. Well, what's a platform? Well, a platform you think about is something that you stand on. Okay, so here's a dude, and he's standing on a platform here, and he's, uh, he's like, wow, this is my platform. So here's the platform. And generally, you don't worry about what's below the platform. You're concerned about what's just on top of the platform. Like, for example, this floor here that I'm standing on, that's my platform. I really don't care what's, this is the second floor, by the way, in this classroom. I really don't care what's going on below it, okay? But I'm just sort of standing on it. All right, so there was a time, in terms of computers, what have you, the platform is what the programmer has to interface with. Okay, and when computers first came out, a long, long time ago in a land far, far away, here's what they had, here's what programmers had to be contented with, had to work with. In those days, the hardware was the platform. And here was the platform that they had to work with. Here was the computer, okay? There was the big computer. And inside the computer, as we all know, there's a central processing unit called the CPU. Okay? So they sort of had to be concerned about that because the CPU has a lot of stuff inside it, and accumulators, registers, and good gracious, who knows what else. So when a programmer was programming, when the hardware was the platform, they had to be concerned about what was going on in here, and we'll give this programmer a big magnifying glass so that he or she can look at it and see what's going on inside the CPU. Let's say these programmers were going to make a word processor, not even a game, okay? So that's me so what's going on with the CPU? Well, the CPU interacts with RAM, random access memory. And as the CPU interacts with that random access memory, it's got to know the memory location, it's got to know what goes in that memory location, it's got to know when to read it, it's got to know when to write it. So they also have to know about this here. So here's another magnifying glass looking at this, and maybe they needed another programmer that would help them uh, do the RAM. And of course, these people were under great stress in order to work with this as a platform. But that was just the beginning, because they also had to worry about, well, if we're going to make a word processor, here, here's the keyboard. And the keyboard, of course, has keys on it, A, S, D, F, G, G, H, J, K, L, semicolon, space bar, and all of that. And the keyboard was connected to an input device. So here's an input. This is the keyboard input. And the keyboard input, they, they had to figure out uh, what key was pressed so the computer would know what key was pressed. So there was another programmer that had, to pro that had to be concerned about this part. We can't make him smile because this is pretty hard work to do. This is very tedious and there are, he's under a lot of stress. We'll give him a magnifying glass to sort of look at this. You worry about the keyboard input. And then, okay, so you got the keyboard input, but you always had, you had to have a video output. And there was a video output that came from uh, some uh, from the RAM, so that when this came in here and was processed by the CPU, this would come up here, and then this would come back down here and go into here, and this would come back here and get information from over here. And so we had to worry about the monitor. Now I'm not talking about the flat screen monitor. No, I'm talking about the old TV set type monitor that had the scanning. <laughs> So it had, if a person pressed the A key here, 
there was someone that had to be concerned of where would the letter A show on the screen. It would have to show in a certain location at a certain time, because this thing was scanning all the time, wasn't it? Yeah, it couldn't just be here, here, here. And then when they pressed the second key, it had to be shown just right after that. Well, obviously, they had another programmer who had to worry about the, uh, the monitor, the output. And we'll give that programmer another magnifying glass to sort of look at this. And there was even more stuff. So when the hardware was the platform, it was a nightmare to program an application for the computer. So this is how the system operates. That's how that system operates. And programmers had to be concerned about all this little bit, how the keyboard interfaced with it, how RAM interfaced with the CPU, how that interfaced with that. And we're not even talking about the disk drive. Because if we have a disk drive here, which of course in those days was the eight and a half inch floppy disk, we had a disk drive here. And that went into a connector that had that was an I.O. connector, meaning input output, and there was another chip here that processed that. So this programmer who was also concerned about that will give her another magnifying glass to sort of be concerned about, well, how do you access the disk? How do you write things on a disk? How do you read things from the disk? And this went on and on. And I'll tell you, having the hardware as a platform was really difficult to program almost anything. And then, if you had another computer whose hardware was slightly different, you know, how that system operates, that'd be like, oh, another nightmare. You had to call, code all this stuff. Woo! So, with all that going on, somebody had a really, really cool idea. Let's see what it was. Let's see what it was. Remember, in the last lecture, we talked about converting software to hardware. And we said, don't ever do that. Don't ever convert software to hardware. Keep it as, keep it as software. Well, somebody had an idea of doing this. Since it was so difficult to work with the hardware as a platform, let's convert the hardware to software. And the, the argument was because if we can have software as the platform instead of hardware, that would be a lot easier to work with. Here was the idea. So here was my old platform, which was the hardware. This is my hardware platform. And of course, with the hardware platform, you had programmers who were pretty much concerned about doing that, and, and they generally weren't too happy. Okay, so we'll make them look not too happy. However, if I can take a level of abstraction now and move up and have a new platform, and this platform here is now software, software platform, This software platform knows exactly how to interact with all the hardware. This software platform knows how to work the keyboard, knows how to work the, the, the CPU, how to work RAM, how to work the disk and all this and that. So the software platform is now a lot easier for a programmer to work with. And now the programmer here is smiling because they don't have to worry about the hardware details. This software platform hides the hardware details from the developer. And since many of you are probably going to be developers, you should be happy to hear that. So let's talk about the software platform. Well, the software platform was they needed a name for it. They said, what do you want to call it? They say, how about uh, the program that uh, operates 
the system. How about the program that operates the system? That's what we'll call this new platform. And they say, okay, so what's the acronym for that? Let's see. How about, we'll leave out the, how about P uh, O S, POS, Program that Operates the System. And they said, nah, POS doesn't sound too good. What do you think we should call it? Well, somebody came up with an idea and they said, instead of calling it the program that operates the system, why not just call this the operating system. And they said, oh yeah, OS. We'll just call that the operating system. So the first operating system that came along, one of the first operating systems, was the disk operating system. There were others too. Known as DOS, which first came out with the PC, and that was the the uh, the uh, grandpappy of Windows. So these programs that operate the system are known as operating systems, and they make it so the developer now works with software rather than having to worry about the details of the hardware. So we've made, we made it, uh, an abstraction on our platform. Our platform has moved up and it's abstracted the hardware and the programmer now interfaces with this platform that we call the operating system. Okay. Now there's another level that's been jumped, sort of, actually with HTML5, a big jump in this platform. And bear with me because this part can be a little bit controversial. It'll be interesting to see what our viewers have to say about this concept. This is an important concept. Okay. So we talk about operating. Unix is another operating system. Okay. The Apple has an operating system and so on. All right, so what, what the issue is nowadays the issue nowadays is, is that you have an Apple and the Apple has an operating system. That understands the Apple hardware. Then you have the PCs and the PC has an operating system. that understands its hardware. And, but this operating system uh, on the macro is different from this operating system. So whenever I program for this operating system, I might have to write a different kind of program for that operating system. And then of course, there are other things that are the uh, iPods, the iPhones, Uh, the U phone, his phone, their phone, that phone, uh, the, the, the pads that you work with, then there's the Androids, then there's all these other internet appliances, all these hardware gizmos that may have different operating systems. Every one of them might have a different operating system. So what's happening now, this is becoming, if I'm going to write now the programmer, sees here's one platform, here's another platform, here's another platform. Now the programmer is almost back in the same soup that they were when the hardware was the platform because now they have to write different code for each platform in order for their code to work on the platform. So let's say again they're doing a word processor so now they began to get stressed out again. So we've got to make the programmer look stressed out. And it, there's more than one programmer that's stressed out. Here's another programmer, and she's all stressed out. So we stressed out our poor programmers again because they're almost back to where they were before. We had the good, cool idea about using software as a platform, but now we have so many different platforms that we're back in the, almost back in the same suit. So here's what we need to do. We need to have another level of abstraction. We need another 
platform that understands what these different platforms are. So we're only programming for one platform. Let's see what that is. What do you think it's going to be? Any guesses out there as to what this might be? What we're going to do is we're going to develop a piece of software that's going to be another platform. And this is going to make our programmers and our developers all happy people again. This, this guy is real happy. So we have a new platform. And this new platform, it's risen up from the operating system platform. This new platform can talk to all the different operating systems. It can interact with them. How many operating systems, no matter how many operating systems I have. And it does it in sort of a cool and tricky way. So this right here are the, this is the platform that's the operating system. This operating system, as you know, goes to the old platform, which was the hardware. Hardware platform. So the way this new platform works is this. You take this program, this is a program, and you install this program on this computer on this platform, you install the same program on this one, you install the same program on this one. This program will install on all these different platforms. So all the, all the developer has to do is write code for this platform and not worry about what the other platforms are like. This will talk to it. And this thing here, this new platform, as you might suspect, is called a browser. And you might say, well, now, wait a minute. Why wasn't this a big deal before? Well, it was sort of a big deal before, but what's really making it a big deal now is this, HTML5. It now makes the browser really super duper nuclear cool powerful. And you might say, wait just a minute, just a minute, Absent. Supposing, all right, you've got different kinds of browsers, right? You have uh, Google Chrome, you've got Firefox, you have Internet Explorer, Opera, and so on and so forth. Supposing this dude here says, well, I just want Firefox, I don't want Google Chrome. This one here says, well, I just want IE, I don't want Firefox. Well, what you can do in the program is you can set up some code, pretty simple, as we'll show you, that will sniff out which browser you're using and just adapt to it. It's not a big deal. It really isn't, trust me. But here's, so, why, what's makes, what, makes, uh, the, the, uh, what makes the browser such a cool thing is this, because now we have a new platform to code to. We don't need to do all this separate stuff for every one of these operating systems. If the operating system supports a browser, The only thing we need in our computer is, if we have to buy a computer in the future, the only thing we need is an operating system that supports a, a, brow a browser. And the browser needs to be W3C compliant. Now I'm talking about W3C, and we haven't mentioned that yet. Don't worry about that now. This is just one that makes it official browser. We're going to talk about what this is, because this is important too. So all we need is a computer that has an operating system that supports the browser, the browser itself that's installed, because it's nothing more than a program, and an internet connection.
We don't need anything else installed on here. As long as we have that, we can now do anything we want. We can now program a, a word processor and you work the word processor through the browser. You can do that now with a Google Docs, G Docs, D-O-C-S. All you have to do is Google G Docs and you'll find out about it. It's free. You can register for it, what have you. You can do spreadsheets through the browser. You can do uh, presentations through the browser. You can do uh, 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 the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, graphics program through the browser. You can do um, all kinds of things right through the browser. You don't need uh, to download and install anything on your computer. So what we're going to do now is let's have a look at the browser as what what is this thing called the browser that is now the new uh, platform? We don't use any of the old platforms, another level of abstraction. So we're going to think of the browser as the platform. And of course, some of our viewers might say, hey, Addison, that's a bit extreme. Well, I know I want it to be a bit extreme because I want you to think of the browser as a platform, the new platform. OK. Now, most people think that the browser, here's the browser, is just a simple, nice, pretty program. That's what they think of the browser. You know, they might bring the browser a flower, you know, and then maybe they have some feelings for, the, for their browser. They like it, a nice, simple, pretty program, and they're looking at the browser, and they're admiring it. This might be a Google Chrome. And what they're doing when they do that they're looking at the browser this way. I'm going to use the iceberg example of a, of a browser an eight, that's using HTML5. The iceberg example of a browser that's using HTML5 is like this. Here's the water. Here's the iceberg. Everything under the water you can't see from up here because the water is the platform here. This is what the view, the average person sees about the browser, all the nice pretty stuff. What they don't see is this, the deep, dark, secret stuff of browsers that very few people know exist here. But we'll find out what they are, because here's how you want to think a browser is. You don't want to think of a browser like that. You want to think of a browser as a big, A big monster platform program. And you're really down here. You're looking up at this when you really understand what it is. You're, people are looking up to it like a big, like it's Godzilla or something, you know? And they're going, wow, W O W. That's what people do when they look up to something. And then here, here's some more people looking up to it, like Godzilla is attacking them, okay? Godzilla, Godzilla and Rodan. So they're looking up here in the browser. These people here are looking up here in the browser. This person is not saying, wow. This person is saying, oh my. Because people will also say, oh my, when they see a giant monster. And just to give the idea, the browser has eyes. It, it can know what you're doing. Okay. It can really know what you're doing. You can even know where you're located. And then it has arms with hands that can change things on your system. Yes, on your system. My goodness, that, these, are, these are giant hands that can go in there and move things around and see what's happening. And, and we've got to give it, uh, let's give it a little arrow here as a tattoo to make it look. And then we've got to give it feet so it can stand. 
And what, what the browser needs, the browser is like a parasite. It needs a computer to feed on. Now you might say, wow, why are we going through all this? Because if you're really going to understand what HTML5 is, and you're really going to be able to use it and what have you, you've got to understand what's under the iceberg. And if people really knew what was under that iceberg, they probably wouldn't put browsers on their computers. It's scary. I'll tell you. You'll see. You'll see in this lecture series. You'll see. Okay. So, with that said, uh, where do we go from here? Well, the next thing that we should go to is after we've told about the browser being a big monster and that it needs, it's like a parasite and what have you. You can do all kinds of things to your system. That's the power of HTML5, but you got to remember that's also what can be the bad thing about HTML5. We need to look at two ways of marketing software with the browser. Okay? Why browsers are so great. And why we're going to think of our browser as the platform, as a new platform. Let's look at the traditional way of marketing software. Okay. The traditional way is we have software as a product, SAAP, software as a product. And here's, here's the deal about software as a product. Let's say, for example, that I, I'm a company and I sell a, a cool graphics program. And everybody likes my graphics program. And the thing is, you can download it, you can install it, but you have to buy it. And, and what happens with my cool graphics program is this. This is my, my company. This is this monetization over time. This is time. And in my company, this represents my expenses or my income. I'm going to represent my expenses by a dotted line. In my company that makes this really, really cool graphic software, our expenses are pretty level. They're about the same. And then what happens is that we release our latest and greatest version of our, of our uh, graphics program. And, and once we get that latest and greatest version out, we start getting sales, and the sales pretty soon go above the expenses, and now we're starting to make a profit. What happens though is after with time, the people that are going to buy it don't need to buy anymore. We've saturated our market, and pretty soon sales go below expenses, and now when that happens, we're eating profits. And in the meantime, we have to, within the next couple of years, come up with another version of, of our super duper graphics program that is so good and so cool that we hope people will again buy uh, the new version for another $800, another $1,200, and then we'll go through this cycle again. So the point with this kind of getting income, uh, doing it this way, it's not reliable. Companies don't like it. This is when you sell software as a product. This is the kind of monetization that you have, and you have to live with it. So let's look at selling software as a service. Here's my chart again, same chart, same company, okay, over time. These are my expenses, relatively constant. When I sell software as a service, I don't allow you to download and install anything. What I do is that I have a browser, and you, your computer can look into that browser and use any of my products within that browser for a monthly fee of, say, and Adobe's doing this now for students, 
and I might get the price wrong, so if, if I do, but it's around $29.95 a month to use the entire uh, suite of stuff that they, the good stuff that they market. And the thing about doing it through a browser is that there's nothing to install on my computer, and the other thing that updates are automatic. So now, what does their income look like? Well, hopefully for them, their income now looks like this. It's above their expenses. It's more of a straight line income rather than having something like this. So what are companies doing now? Instead of selling their software as a product, they're looking at selling their software as a service because now they can have a different kind of a income flow from what they had before. For example, you might say, well, now wait a minute, how can you do that? Well, if you're watching this video, aren't you watching it through a browser? Sure you are. Did you have to install anything from YouTube in order to see this video? No, you didn't have to install anything. Uh, what appliance can you use to see this video? Almost anyone. Why? Because the browser is the platform. You're watching this through a browser. Okay, so software as a service is the way to consider marketing your software. Software as a product is not necessarily the way to go. Okay, that covered the basics so far of our HTML5 lecture series. On our next lecture series, we're going to talk about HTML5 standards, what they mean, how we get them, and why uh, browsers should or shouldn't use those standards. Okay, that's it for this lecture. Thanks for, thanks for being here.